birds, we see sporadic disease in poultry and waterfowl, with young birds being most susceptible. There's a couple of different forms of the disease. In the septicemic form, we can see emaciation and diarrhea, while in the encephalitic form, more neurological signs are going to be seen. So the birds will be depressed, they might be incoordinated, or have other neurological signs. Disease is perhaps associated with cold and wet conditions, and just like in our ruminants, identification of the source of listeria is really a key control measure. Um, unlike our ruminants, poultry do not eat silage, and so it can be more difficult to pinpoint. Um, potentially, it's found in the poultry litter. We know the birds are shedding it in the feces, so cleaning up the barn environment may be a useful uh, management strategy. Listeria is uncommon in dogs and cats. Uh, there's a very high infectious dose, greater than approximately 1 billion organisms, so it takes a lot of uh, bacteria in order to cause disease. In dogs and cats, we see a similar pathogenesis as in people. They're typically exposed by eating contaminated food, and the disease can be, again, either gastrointestinal or neurological and systemic. Gastrointestinal disease is characterized by fever, diarrhea, and vomiting. And when we have systemic disease, it often results from organisms localizing to either the placenta or the central nervous system. This is also a very important uh, cause of illness in people. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control estimates that there's approximately 1,600 cases and 260 annual deaths in the United States. The groups of people at highest risk include pregnant women, who are actually 10 times more likely to develop an infection than the general public. And in these women, it's actually a very important cause of abortion. Elderly are another at-risk group, estimated to be approximately four times more likely to develop an infection than the general public. And then those with compromised immune systems. So this can be a really obvious patient cohort, those with cancer, on immunosuppressive therapy, or with HIV AIDS, but also people with kind of less obvious uh, reasons, so liver or kidney disease, diabetes, or alcoholism. There's some really useful information at the CDC website, and I'd encourage anyone who's looking for more to go to this link. Following exposure to listeria in the diet, Transient carriage in the GI tract is the most common outcome. An acute symptomatic illness is also possible, much more frequently during pregnancy, and this involves flu-like symptoms. Uh, the mother recovers follow birth, and unfortunately, fetal survival really depends on gestational age. So the younger the fetus, the less likely it is to survive. In non-pregnant adults, uh, systemic infection, so sepsis, or neurological infections, meningoencephalitis are possible, as are focal abscesses, which can occur at a variety of body sites. This is some data from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and what you can see is the annual number of reported cases of listeria monocytogenes in people over time. So from 2007 up to 2021, and you can see we're sitting at approximately 150 cases a year. People most often acquire listeria monocytogenes from contaminated food. These foods might include uncooked meats and vegetables, raw dairy products, or processed foods. So things like ready-to-eat or smoked meats and soft cheeses are also common culprits. Because listeria monocytogenes can grow at such low temperatures, including 4 degrees Celsius, which means that once contaminated, a food product, even refrigerated, has the potential to become dangerous. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency issues recalls for food products that are known to be contaminated with listeria monocytogenes. And looking back at what's been seen recently, there's quite a wide variety of foods. So we have some of our common culprits, things like soft cheeses, uh, we've also had blackberries, uh, and mushrooms. If you're interested in finding more information about food recalls, um, take a look at the Public Health Agency of Canada website. You can search for information on current recalls or about recalls caused by a particular etiology. I found this case report, which I thought was really interesting, um, because this patient had what in people is a very unusual presentation for listeria, 
that actually manifested in a way that we may see more commonly in our ruminant species. This patient did not have encephalitis and only presented with ophthalmic symptoms. So they were diagnosed with endophthalmitis, so inflammation of the inside of the eye. This was evident as hypopion, which is the presence of purulent material in the eye, which may equal infection in the brain and something that we do commonly see in, in large animals with encephalitis. So if we look at the eye of this person, you can see here down on the uh, dependent region, we have settling out of white blood cells. When the patient was first examined by their physician, uh, the suspect diagnosis was ophthalmic uh, herpes, and so the patient was treated with valcyclovir and prednisolone. This didn't work, um, no improvement was seen, and so it was then presumed to be bacterial, and the patient was put on a course of vancomycin, so a glycopeptide antimicrobial, and ciftazidine, which is a third-generation cephalosporin. Following bacteriological diagnosis, um, the patient was started on IV ampicillin, which is really the treatment of choice uh, for Listeria monocytogenes in people. The infection was resolved, and interestingly, once the hypopion had cleared up, uh, a marked heterochromia was seen in this patient's irises, so shedding of the pigment in the right eye uh, was observed. We're briefly going to mention Listeria ivanovii. This was previously known as Listeria monocytogenes serotype 5, and it's a cause of abortion in ruminants. Typically, these occur three to five weeks following exposure to spoiled feed, and outbreaks of infections and abortions have been reported in sheep. It's believed to be more host-specific than Listeria monocytogenes, so it may not have the same zoonotic potential or potential to infect other animals. Um, in experimental infections, other, other species of Listeria have not been demonstrated to be uh, pathogenic in mouse infection trials. Although, of course, we can find case reports in the literature. So here we had a paper in Emerging Infectious Diseases um, describing human listeriosis caused by Listeria ivanovii. So in biology, we never, never say never. Anything is possible. Specimens to collect are really going to depend on the presentation of the animals. So in the septicemic form, we want to collect viscera, uh, the liver, kidney, spleen, in neurological disease, uh, the CSF, so the cerebrospinal fluid and brainstem. In this image here, you can see a medullary abscess uh, caused by Listeria monocytogenes. Now, this isn't a typical presentation. More commonly, we see microabscesses in the brain, which would only be visible histologically. In cases of abortion, we want to collect placenta and the fetus, including those fetal abomasal contents. And we also want to collect silage. So here what you want to do is aseptically collect approximately 100 grams of silage in a sterile container um, and send this to the lab for processing. Um, one thing that's really convenient about Listeria is that we can freeze these samples. And actually freezing them at minus 20 degrees Celsius can actually be a really useful way of enriching for Listeria monocytogenes by preventing the growth of contaminants and other organisms that may be present. Labs will oftentimes use a cold enrichment technique where they will keep silage in the refrigerator and subsample from it uh, on a periodic basis um, if their cultures are coming back negative. Listeria continues to grow in the fridge, and so we get higher and higher numbers that eventually uh, become detectable, or at least that's the idea. Listeria will be grown using traditional culture methods, so it will readily grow on blood agar. Um, and there are selected media uh, available as well. So either in-house prepared media um, or commercial proprietary formulas that are used in food safety uh, settings. As I mentioned, cold enrichment can facilitate growth, um, so putting your, your sample in broth in the fridge and performing weekly cultures. Pregnant women should avoid contact with sheep and goats, particularly at lambing and kidding. If those animals were to abort, all of those tissues potentially harbor Listeria monocytogenes or other pathogens, which are actually abortogenic in humans. 
Those most at risk of listeria from directly from animals are veterinarians and abattoir workers. And then listeria ivanovii may be isolated from severely immunocompromised people. So those with AIDS, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, or transplant recipients. But since we're talking about interspecies transmission and not just zoonotic transmission, I wanted to highlight this really interesting case report uh, where a person actually transmitted listeria monocytogenes uh, unfortunately to her own baby, but also to a litter of puppies that she was looking after. So listeria will be shed in the milk following parturition in our ruminant species, but it also localizes to those tissues in people. And so the woman described in this paper had shared excess breast milk with her puppies, inadvertently leading to the transmission of listeria. In ruminants with listeria, um, the treatment of choice is high-dose penicillin. In companion animals, we would typically reach for something like ampicillin plus gentamicin, so parenteral therapy. Listeria are intrinsically resistant to the cephalosporins and fluoroquinolones, and so these drugs should be avoided. And finally, management strategies such as removing poor quality silage from feeding and ensuring that forges are properly ensiled and that an adequately low pH is reached are really, really critical to preventing uh, contamination and subsequent infection. Three new terms today and a couple of questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.